morning, everyone. Hey, we've been talking about Nerf guns at church, and it's been a blast. Uh, we're in this series, Nerf Guns and Slingshots, uh, taking aim at what really matters. And as followers of Jesus, as people uh, who are here to celebrate His grace or learn about His grace, uh, there's, some, there's some things that we aim at. There's some things that, that maybe above everything else that uh, we should focus on. And we started out week one talking about how uh, we should grow, we should progress in our faith, that we shouldn't just stay the same. You know, well, I gave my life to Jesus, so I'm good, and we just operate the same. There should be, uh, the verse we looked at said, increasing measure which means that there should be increasing amounts of goodness and godliness, perseverance, self-control, things like that. Evidence that God is at work in our life. And so that should be forward moving. Last week, we talked about people. We talked about that as Jesus' people, Jesus came for people, which means that our mission as the church is people. That's why we're here. That's why we meet together. We encourage one another. We laugh together. We learn together. And we go and we hopefully invite others in this journey to find Jesus as well. And so what really matters is that we grow and that our faith moves. What really matters is that we have an eye for people who are far from God. And it's our mission to bring them close to God. And today as we continue this conversation as far as what what really matters to God and what really matters to Jesus if we're to follow him. And where we're going to land this morning, it affects almost every area of our life. Our conversation this morning, it impacts uh, what we do, how we do it, and sometimes even who we do it with. It impacts how we raise our kids sometimes. It, it impacts so many different areas of life. I want to pray and then we're going to find out what it is. God, I'm so thankful for your church. I'm thankful that we can be here. We can celebrate, we can learn, and we can laugh. God, I'm thankful that together we can learn what it means to be a follower of you. And there's not one of us in the room that has it figured out completely. And so we encourage each other as we learn. Father, I pray that right now is the time where we will learn together. And your word will step into the middle of our lives and it will speak truth and it will confront and it will comfort and God, your word will provide light into our life. And Father, I pray that we allow it to. God, I pray this morning, if we're choosing darkness, God, that we will let go. And Father, that we will pursue you, recognizing that you're good. God, I'm thankful this morning that as because of your grace, because of your son on the cross, we can meet here right now as a room of sinful people. And we can celebrate your goodness. Jesus, we're thankful for who you are. It's in your name we pray. Amen. I heard a story this past week about a man who dug wells. And as he was hired different places, he would always give the same advice. And the advice was you need to make sure that you uh, pump water from your well every day. And there was a specific man that he, uh, he went to his house and he dug his well. And as he was leaving, he said, there's one important thing that you need to remember. And the man said, what's that? He said, you need to pump water from your well every time or every day. And the man said, okay, I, I can... Yeah, sure, no, not a problem, I can do that. And so every day he would walk out and he would, even days when he didn't need water, he still recognized the need and so he walked out and he pumped some water from the well. Day in and day out, he kept doing this over and over and over again and after a little while, he, he started wondering, why am I even doing this? This is just a lot of work, I feel like I'm wasting water some days. I, I don't really understand it and so, you know, some days, some days it was the end of the day and he would remember and he'd run out there right before he went to bed Finally, uh, months into the process, he went on vacation. While he was on vacation, he was about halfway through the vacation, and he remembered, oh, I didn't get anybody to pump my well. Not too worried about it. He said, well, I'll be home in two days, and I'll take care of it. And so the man arrived home, and shortly after dropping his things off uh, at his house, he walked out to the well, and he started pumping water, and he quickly found out that there was no more water. He, he pumped a little bit harder, nothing, nothing happened. And so he, he calls the man that dug as well, and he says, listen, you did something wrong. He said, I, I don't have any water anymore. And the man who dug as well, he, he said, back, he said, well, did, did you stop pumping the water? Did you pump it every day like I told you to? And, and the man said, well, I mean, I did, I did consistently just until recently. He said, well, what happened recently? He said, well, I, I went on vacation, and I forgot to get someone to come over and, and pump some water each day. And he said, well... Your well is dried up. 
He said, what do you mean my well is dried up? He said, I was only gone for five days. And he said, well, what you need to know is that there are small streams that supply your well. And, and he said, if you, don't, if you don't come back to the well, he said, you'll miss the water supply and it will, it will dry up. And the streams will find some place else if they're not needed. He said, you forgot, and because you forgot, the supply dried up. See, when it comes to our topic of today, sometimes we respond the same way. When it comes to, when it comes to money and when it comes to our finances, when it comes to this topic, we sometimes forget about our supplier. We forget where our supply comes from and we think, well, if I work enough, then I will, I'll be able to supply the well. And if, you know, if I get a second job, then I will be able to s- supply the well. When the truth is, is that the supply comes from the giver and the giver is God. I know, I know before we get any further, I, I know when it comes to the topic of money, there's some of us that immediately are like, oh man, the church is talking about money again. You're right, and I'm not going to shy away from it. Here's why. As I've said before, Jesus talks about money more than anything else while he's on this earth. And so if we're supposed to be Jesus followers, that means that we're going to talk about money. And if that makes you uncomfortable, and if immediately you're defensive about it, then I want to challenge you to maybe ask why that's your immediate reaction. Is it maybe because of fear? Is it maybe because of guilt? Is it because of the unknown? Is it because you've had a bad past experience? And all of those could be answers. And so I don't want to diminish any of them, but I do want to offer us a better solution today. In this next year, what would it look like as Jesus' people if we aimed at generosity? And this past year, as I mentioned a couple weeks ago, as a church, we did an awesome job at this. We... we, let go of we opened up and we said you know what i'm going to trust and god blessed that and he did incredible things uh, through us as a church but what would it look like if that was a an aim that as individuals and as a church we said you know what i, I want to live in such a way that it's easy to see that god is a giver for other people around <laughs> i heard another story this past week a well-worn $1 bill and a well-worn $20 bill. They had worn out their welcome when it came to being used in society, and so they arrived at the Federal Reserve Bank to be retired. As they moved along the conveyor belt to be burned, the dollar bill and the $20 bill, they struck up a conversation. The $20 bill reminisced about the travels all over the country. He said, I've had a pretty good life. He said, you know, I've been to Las Vegas, I've been to Atlantic City, the finest restaurants in New York, performances on Broadway, even cruises in the Caribbean. Wow, the dollar bill said, you really have lived an exciting life. So tell me, says the $20 bill, where have you been throughout your lifetime? The dollar bill sat for a moment and thought, he said, well... I've been to the Methodist, and I've been to the Baptist, and I've been to the Christian church, and I've been to the Lutheran church. The $20 bill looks back at me and says, what's a church? Oh. (laughs) That was a dad joke, wasn't it? Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. We joke, and, you know, it, it... Money is one of those things that's just a little bit uncomfortable. We like to stay private about it. You know, I mean, sometimes when it comes to the topic, most of us have probably seen the movie The Lion King. You know the scene in uh, Lion King where the hyenas are kind of hanging out together towards the beginning of the movie, and they keep keep saying Simba's dad's name, Mufasa? Remember their reaction? Say, Mufasa. They all shudder together. And that sometimes is the response of church people when it comes to money in church. But if we're... If we're going to follow Jesus, and if we're going to follow him the way that he wants us to, then, friends, we just need to have a conversation. Because laced all throughout the Gospels is beautiful moments when Jesus looks and says, there's generosity, and this is what it looks like. And this morning, I want us to take a moment to look at one of those stories. But before we jump into that, we need to kind of lay the groundwork, recognizing the God that we are here to worship You know, the God that we sang just a few minutes ago, take me further, take me deeper than my faith has ever been. God, I I trust you. 
And you see, the God that we are here to worship this morning, he made us. He designed us. And in Genesis chapter 1, verse 27, it says this. It says, so God created mankind in his own image. In the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. You see, you and I, we are created in the image of God. What does the image of God mean? Well, if you have kids, and maybe when your kids were growing up, or maybe right now when they're still little, someone has said to you, oh, man, your kid looks just like you, right? Or your kid looks just like their dad. Maybe a few of you have said, is that your kid? You know, it, all right, you know, it's whatever. But a lot of times you can see the reflection of the parents in the child. And, and that's, that's what it means is that in us, in us, we have been given, we have been made in the image of God. We've been made in the reflection of who God is. Which means that you and I, we carry and we live the characteristics of God if we choose to. And when you look at the God of the Bible, which is who we celebrate and who we put our hope in, he gives over and over and over again. He gave direction through the Exodus. He gave wisdom through the prophets. He sent his son to this world. And when you look at Jesus, he gave sight. He gave healing. He gave forgiveness. He gave wine at the wedding. He gave light. He gave away. Over and over and over again, we see a God who enjoys giving. You see, our truth this morning, before we look at this example, is this. We become more like God when we give because God is a giver. Jesus illustrates what this looks like. If you brought a Bible, go ahead and open it up to Mark chapter 12. Mark chapter 12, we encounter Jesus, and he is having a conversation with some of his disciples, and he's kind of people watching. He's, he's sitting off to the side of the crowd, and as he is doing so, he's looking out at the crowd, he's having a conversation with the disciples, but they're just kind of looking over the temple courts. And as they're looking over the temple courts, something happens that stops Jesus mid-conversation. And it is enough that he calls all of his disciples to get their attention as well. Mark chapter 12, we're going to begin in verse 41. It says this. Jesus sat down opposite the place where the offerings were put and watched the crowd putting their money into the temple treasury. Many rich people threw in large amounts, but a poor widow came and put two very small copper coins worth only a few cents. Calling his disciples to him, Jesus said, truly I tell you, this poor widow has put more into the treasury than all of the others. They gave out of their wealth, but she, out of her poverty, put in everything, all she had to live on. You see, in the temple, there was a room. It was known as the temple treasury. And on one side of the room, there were these large collection basins. And what would happen is, as part of the religion during this days, people would come and they would bring their offering to the temple. And as it mentioned, that they, there were some that they would bring large amounts. And what they would do is they would take big bags of coin. And they would take these coins, and instead of just like dumping them in or pouring them in, they would take these coins and they would throw them up against the side of this cistern. And so it would ring out and everybody would hear what was going on. And so as the wealthy people came in, they wanted everybody around to know how much they were giving. And so they would take their offering and they'd throw it inside and up against the edge of this cistern. And everybody would hear the clang of all of these coins. And so Jesus is sitting with his disciples. They're observing this room. They're listening to all of these people come in and throw their money up against, you know, as, as an offering, but also to be noticed. And as they're sitting there talking, having this conversation... Pretty soon this widow walks in. You see, during this time period, if you're a widow, there was no life insurance policy to take care of you. There was, there was really nothing in this culture. It was a male-dominant society. Everything that you did and who you were was built in your husband. And so for this woman to lose her husband, she really has almost lost her identity. She has lost everything that she knows. And honestly, everything that she has. And as she walks in, she walks in, her head's down just a little bit, and she hears the clang of these large offerings. And she reaches into her pocket, and she realizes that she only has just a couple coins. That's what she had brought with her that day. And as she slowly walks 
up to the cisterns. She walks maybe next to a guy with a big bag of money, and he smiles at her and throws it in. And she quietly pulls just a couple coins, and she just drops them in the basin. No one but her heard him hit the bottom. The commotion of the crowd was too much. No one in the crowd heard what her gift sounded like. Only, only she knew the value of it. But you see, it wasn't only her. Because as she dropped these two small coins in, and she turns and walks past the crowd of people, it stops Jesus mid-conversation. And his disciples are sitting around him. And, you know, some of them, they're watching the crowd. Some of them are checked out, you know. Peter's over here, and he's maybe kind of halfway paying attention to what Jesus is saying. And, you know, then, then there's Matthew, who used to be the tax collector. And so he's sitting in the back, and he hears the ring of the coins. And so he's in his mind calculating, well, that probably is about this much. And all of a sudden, Jesus sees this woman give this offering. And he looks to the guys around him. He says, guys, come here. Listen, you have to pay attention to this. Disciples not sure what's going on. They kind of lean in, and Jesus says, listen, you notice all these people that have just walked in and given these big offering amounts, and they want to get noticed? Yeah, 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 Jesus, we saw that. Yeah, they're doing a good thing. Listen, you see that woman right there? Did you hear her offering hit the side? No, 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 we must have, we must have missed out. I'm, I'm sorry, Jesus. We, we... No, you probably didn't hear it. Because she didn't, she didn't give a whole bag she didn't walk in with her glass jar of spare change or, you know, her mason jar of spare change. She didn't, she just came in with a Ziploc bag with two coins in the bottom. You probably missed it, but all of these people, they're, they're giving out of their wealth. But this woman, she just dropped two coins in. Oh, I mean, that's not much of an offering. No, wait a minute, guys. She gave out of everything she had. And she gave more than all of these people did. You see, for the disciples in this moment, they're slightly dumbfounded. What do you mean? You see, they're just looking at the value. And Jesus is not looking at the value. He's not paying attention to the value. What he's looking at is the condition of the person bringing the offering. You see, what this woman does is she comes and she brings this small offering that stops Jesus and draws Jesus into this conversation. You see, all of the rich people bringing their money in, they were bringing their money in, A, to show off, to be noticed, because for them, most of them, money was a god. Money was a god, and it was to be worshipped, and it was to be achieved, and it was to be shown off, and it was to be pursued more than anything else. And it sounds a lot like our culture, doesn't it? Money has become a God and we worship it and we run for it and we try to achieve the most that we can and it consumes so much of what we do. You see, but this woman, as she comes, it, it's not a God to her. It's a gift. It's a gift. It's, it's a sacrifice. It's everything that she has. You see, she is living her life not holding on to but letting go of. This morning, if you were just personally in your mind, if you were to evaluate when it comes to the generosity in your household, when it comes to, when it comes to what we bring to the table, do we live life when it comes to our finances of holding on to or letting go? You see, the reason that Jesus pointed this out is not just to teach his disciples, but to teach all of us, to engage us in this conversation about generosity. You see, he knows, he knows that money will battle our heart. He knows that money will reach deep and try to warp our vision and, and try to twist the truth to try to get us distracted. He knows that money is going to be a constant battle in our lives. And so every opportunity he gets, he stops the disciples and he stops us and he said, friends, pay close attention. Because a life of generosity that we let go of is far more than the mountains that we may earn. You see, when we give out of generosity, we put on the character of God because God is a giver. If I asked you the question at the beginning of today, how many of us want to be like God? We probably all would have raised our hands. One of the ways that this happens, especially today, 
is when we let go instead of hold, holding on to. Is, is money in your life, is it a gift or is it a God? And oftentimes the answer to that question in today's day and age determines the depth of our relationship with Jesus. When I look at this story uh, with this woman, there's a couple of observations that it, throughout the week as I was studying learned through. Well, observation number one for all of us as we look at this woman and her offering, observation number one is that God measures our giving not by the amount that we give to him, but by the amount that we keep for ourselves. And this woman, it, as she turns and she walks away, what does it say? It, she reached in her purse and grabbed out some extra and went to the vending machine. Oh, Jesus says, he's talking with his disciples, he says, listen, she put in everything, all that she had to live on. And that's what got Jesus' attention. It was by the amount that she kept for herself. It was, it was nothing. And friends, listen, don't get me wrong. I'm not saying that we just need to go and sell everything and get rid of everything. But there should be an aspect of our heart where we would be willing to. You see, when we, when we give, we become more like God. Because God is a giver. God lives with generosity running deep through his veins. And when he sees the need of his children, he shows up. And it might not be how we expect. But when we live life letting go of, Instead of holding on to, we say, God, I know that you are there. The second observation that we can see is that no one is too poor to give. No one's too poor to give. A lot of times when it comes to this idea of money and the church and giving, we think, well, I just don't have enough. I don't have enough to give. Well, what would it look like if generosity came first? What would it look like if it wasn't about too poor or too rich, it's just, God, what can I give to you? And we lived on faith and not our understanding. One day, the father of a very wealthy family took his son on a trip to the country to, to show him, the purpose of this trip was to show him how poor people lived. They spent a couple of days and nights on a farm that they would have considered a very poor family. On the return from the trip, the father asked his son, how was your trip? It was great, dad. Well, did you see how poor people lived, son? Oh, yeah, said the son. So tell me, what did you learn from this trip, asked the father. The son replied, I saw that we have one dog, and they had four. We have a pool that reaches to the middle of our garden, and they have a creek that has no end. We have imported lanterns in the garden, and they have stars at night. Our patio reaches to the front yard, and they have the whole horizon. We have a small piece of land to live on, and they have fields that go beyond our sight. We have servants who serve us, but they serve others. We buy our food, and they grow theirs. We have walls around our property to protect us, and they have friends to protect them. The boy's father was speechless, and then the son looked at his dad, and he added this, Thanks, Dad, for showing me how poor we really are. You see, sometimes it's a matter of perspective change. Sometimes it's a matter of just shifting our focus away from us and onto what God has given us. Because it's not about how much or how little. It's about how willing. And as Jesus points at this woman, he says she is more than willing. The third observation is this. We will never learn to give until we learn to trust God. We'll never learn to give until we learn to trust God. As she walks away, she has nothing but trust to hold on to. I mean, if you think about it, I mean, it teaches right there. All that she had to live on, she put in the cistern. As you turn away, there is uncertainty, there is unknown. There are questions that you don't have answers to, and you're not going home to a husband that is providing for your family because she's a widow. 
You see, what's obvious in this woman's life is that she has learned to trust. She's learned to trust in the God that she just gave to. She's learned to trust that God will step in and be present. She has learned to trust. And because she has learned to trust, it's easier for her to live life letting go. And so maybe the question this morning isn't, are we willing to give? Maybe the question this morning is, are we willing to trust? Are we willing to trust God that is the giver? Are we willing to trust a God that pours out on us? Are we willing to trust, even in the uncomfortable moments of our life, are we willing to let go of and recognize that God, running through his veins, is a giver? And we live life letting go. You see, when we do this, it it should bring joy to our life. Because the act of giving, when it comes to When it comes to the church, Paul gives us instructions in 2 Corinthians. It's not a mortgage payment. It's not a utility bill. Those are chores. 2 Corinthians chapter 9 says, Each of you should give what you've decided in your heart to give, not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. God loves a cheerful giver, not a downtrodden, beat-up giver. He loves them too. He loves a cheerful giver. You see, as we let go of It should bring joy that we get to worship in this way. Why is it? Why is it that we get to worship in that way? Why is it that we get to have a conversation that might be a little bit uncomfortable? Why is it that we get to learn together and we get to be here together? Well, it's because of what's described to us in John 3.16. A verse that we know, many of us, that we've heard before. For God so loved the world that he did what? He gave. He gave, and he didn't, just, he didn't just give a little bit. He gave a lot, friends. He didn't just give what was convenient. He gave who? He gave his only son. And that whoever, whoever was facing death because of sin won't face that punishment anymore. But we will have life. Why do we have life? Why do we... But why do we meet here on Sunday mornings? Why do we get this chance to celebrate God's goodness? It's because God gave. God gave his son to a cross. And because of that cross this morning, we get a chance to worship. Because of that cross that we like to think about it, it gives us forgiveness. It doesn't just give us forgiveness, it pours out on us. You see, God, God let go of, God let go of his son and said, go, I'm giving you to this world. I'm giving you to my children to pay the price of their sin. And Jesus, friends, I can't help but wonder, If the reason that Jesus noticed this woman's gift is because the same thing that she just did is what he is getting ready to do. The same way that she gave everything that she had, he's getting ready to do. He's getting ready to give everything that he has, including his life, for you and me. And as she turns and walks away, she has nothing but trust. And as he walks up to a cross, he has nothing but trust. You see, friends, when we give, when we aim at generosity in our lives, we put on the character of God because God is a giver. But we don't give just out of duty. We don't just give out of religion. We give because it's an act of worship and a celebration of the God that is given to us. Friends, when we give, we become like God because God is a giver. Why don't we go ahead and stand together? (laughs) Sometimes when it comes to this topic, we, we can check out pretty easy. We can, we can just watch our phones and maybe some of us are checking Facebook But the truth is, is that the number one competitor that Satan wants to use to deceive you, to trick you, to worry you, to tempt you, 
is your finances. And so the reason that Jesus talks about it so much is because he wants what's best for you. He wants to see you grow. He wants to see you love people. He wants to see you live with hope and forgiveness. He wants those things for you. And it's hard for that to happen when we're worshiping another God. It's hard for that to happen when our hearts are divided. It's hard for that to happen when our focus is elsewhere other than Jesus. And maybe this morning as we get ready to worship, maybe this morning this is an area in our lives that we've never let go of. We get frustrated, we get defensive, we tune out, we check out. But maybe this morning, God is wanting to step in. Maybe this morning, God's wanting to step into an area of your life that's been nothing but worry and stress. And maybe he wants to say, listen, just have faith in who I am. Trust me in this process. You can't outdo or outgive who I am. I gave you life for eternity. You can't match that with a second job. Maybe this morning as we worship, it's God, I need you to step into this area of my life. God, I need to surrender this to you. God, I'm sorry that I've been fighting you so long on this. God, I'm sorry that I've been worshiping elsewhere. And culture got me. But I want to follow you. And so God, this morning, I'm here and I'm yours. Maybe, maybe this morning what you have to give is yourself. Maybe it's, Jesus, I've never accepted your forgiveness. I've never been baptized. I, I, I don't know what hope looks like because right now I don't have any. And gosh, before we worry about our pocketbooks, let's worry about eternity. And maybe that's where we start today. This morning, let us hold on to faith. Faith that God is good. Faith that God is a giver. Faith that God provided a way for a reason. And it's for you and I to celebrate and worship that he is good. Let's sing together.